Missouri Democratic Party Chairman Stephen Weber has an unenviable job rebuilding his party after a disastrous 2016 election cycle. But the former state representative from Columbia feels that the Democrats have the momentum going into 2018. We talked to him about the party's progress on another edition of Politically Speaking, so let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, a candid conversation with the Show Me State's biggest political newsmakers. I'm Jason Merzenbaum. And I'm Joe Manis. That's Eric Greitens, Navy <laughs> SEALs running for governor, and I'm really, really glad to be on with you, Jason and Joe. I'm going to push back on these regulators. I'm doing this for the people. I was encouraged along the way, not just by my family, but by a lot of teachers and professors and knew when I was in college that I would run for office someday. We're very excited about the prospect of having some more free market solutions. Even though after the conversation, I still might not agree. We want our listeners to get a real sense of what drives these people. They're actually people with a story to tell. And welcome to the Politically Speaking podcast, the only show about Missouri politics featuring a host that does not like the downtown student housing in Columbia. <laughs> I'm your host, Jason Rosenbaum, a reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. Joining me in studio today is... Joe Manis, uh, who knows nothing about this. <laughs> you know, by the way, I've just uh, thrown in all of these, like, random taglines into the beginning of the show just to make Joe laugh, <laughs> and I'm right. succeeding. <laughs> And I guess the reason I use that tagline, because we have a Columbia, Missouri native in studio. Our guest today is... Stephen Weber, chair of the Missouri Democratic Party. Welcome back. It's good to be here. Yeah, good. The last time you were here, you were state representative Stephen Weber. Now you're Missouri Democratic Party chairman Stephen Weber. Did did you imagine that would happen a year ago? Uh, this was not something that I ever uh, planned on doing. Um, it wasn't just something. It wasn't like a, a goal that I set out to, to achieve. But it's it's um, it became clear after dis- uh, November that we need to make changes here in Missouri. Um, the uh, Democratic Party needs to to sort of be rebuilt, and uh, I think this is where I can best serve. And so I'm excited to do it. Yeah, just so our listeners know, uh, Weber had been the, actually the favorite candidate for the state senate for much of 2016, but it didn't work out that way uh, because of the Trump tsunami at the end uh so but some party leaders and others i think claire mccaskill was among the ones who encouraged you to take this current job uh, she did I, t- I talked to a lot of folks and, and yeah. she and, and and um obviously she's with her race as being so, as important as it is um that was sort of extra motivation to get and to you've gotten clients. high marks within the party for trying to do what you can to kind of energize the party and Change the image. I mean, Jason was in uh, northwest Missouri. Northeast. Just, northeast, sorry, a few days ago, and you were saying something about was there anybody who was a Democrat who was under 70? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> so that, we can we can use that as a kicking off point. Yeah. And, and, and I don't want to get too granular into my northeast Missouri voyage, but it does seem like the Missouri Democratic Party is in not so good shape. Um The rural parts of the states, even parts of the states that used to be very Democratic, are now fairly Republican after 2016. Candidates like yourself and all the statewide aspirants lost. And I want to know kind of the state of the Missouri Democratic Party when you got there and the challenge it's going to take to rise it back up again. Right. So there's a lot there. (laughs) We could talk for many, many hours about this. Um, First off, uh, November was a disaster uh, for Democrats, both in Missouri and and nationwide. And there's really no sugarcoating that. There's no um, way to sugarcoat it, no reason to sugarcoat it. Uh, So it is an opportunity to rebuild things. And and that's what we're looking at doing. Uh, Here in Missouri, we've been losing um, seats in rural areas um, over a period of years. It's nothing that happened overnight. Um, but when I, when I came into the legislature in, in 2009, there were a lot of rural Democrats, um, you know, uh, Frank Barnett, Swess Schumeyer, uh, Rachel Bringer, Terry Witte, uh, Tom, Tom Todd. I mean, keep going. There's a lot of folks. Oh, yeah, because it used to be – I mean, because I've been to, going to Democrat days in Hannibal since 1991. I've been to every one. And it used to be they would have this morning press conference and there would be this crowd – of local state legislators, many of mm-hmm. who had hospitality suites. Now, there's none. There are no Democrats representing Northeast Missouri So they even anymore. canceled mm-hmm. the morning uh, Saturday press conference Which, because I, there's I, nobody to be there. And I've mentioned this a bunch of times. I don't mean to be de- beating a dead horse, but you know, when I started reporting on Missouri politics, as you mentioned, Democrats held a majority of, of, of lawmakers in Northeast Missouri. They had Wes Schumeyer. They mm-hmm. had uh, Terry Witte, Paul Quinn. 
Tom Shively. And now after 2010 to this point, there's nobody there. And there's also nobody in other traditionally Democratic parts of rural Missouri, uh, you know, like Saline County, the Boot Heel, even parts of, of Northwest Missouri. Wh- why do you think this has happened? I think you may have a, a yeah. close and personal reason why. So let me say a couple things. First off, there's some structural reasons that are that I, I don't want to be dismissive of, but I don't want to, to, to spend my time harping on. There's things like uh, in gerrymandering and redistricting reform. There's uh, the no limits in Missouri politics, which allowed a couple of billionaires to pour in tens of millions of dollars. That makes a difference. So all that stuff is there, and, and that stuff does have an impact. But let's, let's set that aside. Um, you know, our party has been... Uh, the Democratic Party has been the party of of healthcare, the party of public education, the, the party of working people, and I believe that our policies have always reflected that. I don't I don't think we've we've strayed from those policies. I do think that we've been unable to connect on sort of a visceral emotional level with people on those issues, and so I uh, I think we need to do a better job of that. And that's one of the things that I'm working on when I'm going to these uh, counties. And I've been to over 50 counties. Um, since January, and I go speak to Democratic clubs, um, and the things that they want to talk about are, um, you know, they're concerned about uh, their school, whether their school is, is going to be going four days uh, a week next year rather than five. Uh, they're concerned about health care. Um, there's a woman up in, in, in uh, Anita in Holt County up by the Nebraska border um, who just got the health insurance under the ACA exchange uh, after going 15 years without health insurance. And she's very, very concerned about what this health bill looks like because she's not sure she can afford uh, to keep her, her insurance, um, depending on what the, the Republicans do. Um, and all these they're farmers, I met one last night, actually, in, in Wright County, um, who's concerned that what Donald Trump and his, his blustering and his uh, all that is jeopardizing Missouri farmers' access to foreign markets. Um, he's concerned about Donald Trump cutting crop insurance um, and, and gutting that program. And so these, these concerns are out there. The Democratic Party uh, represents these values. We are correct on the policy. We need to connect with people on this. Well, is part of it that your message doesn't match that? I mean, some would say that in the 2016 election, for right or wrong, looking broadly, that there wasn't as much focus on economics and like public schools and this and that. In some ways, uh, it was a feeling that Democrats assumed that the public knew what they stood for and maybe they didn't. I mean, Republicans get a message and they drive that baby in the ground. I mean, they do not change whatever their message is. I mean, and, and Governor Greitens, I mean, in fact, Jason played some audio for a previous uh, podcast, and I thought it was something that I had recorded of Greitens. It actually was something different, but it was the same words like the day before. My point being is he's got his message down, and he sticks with it. And I'm not criticizing that. I'm saying in some cases that's been one of the Republican strengths is that they get the message down and they don't deviate. Right. I think that's I think that's a that's a fair critique. Um, and I think that uh, maybe Democrats did because because we were we were correct on the policy. Like when eight years I was in the legislature, you know, I saw how the Democrats were voting in ways that benefited working people in the way that the Republicans were, were hurting them. Um, and so maybe there is some assumption there that, that people know that. One good example is, uh, for example, public education. For the last eight years um, or longer, Democrats have been talking about underfunding the foundation formula, which is, uh, from a policy perspective, is, is, is absolutely a problem, and we're correct to point that out. But underfunding a formula is like the least motivating electoral message uh, you can come up with. When there's you know, 13, 14, 15 school districts in the state now that are, are going to school four days a week rather than five because they can't afford buses, that is a much more visceral uh, way to talk about the same issue. Now, I know you didn't want to touch on gerrymandering very much, but I, I kind of do because I've heard a lot of Democrats blame their woes in the General Assembly on gerrymandering. I don't want to get too deep into how state legislative districts are drawn and how mainly courts do that. But I, I can you convince me that that is the reason or that is a big reason? Because I'm not fully convinced Gerrymandering, oh, abs- gerrymandering had an had, a, had an effect. I want you to make the case. Absolutely, it is. I mean, if you look at towns, um, look at Columbia, right? I mean, Boone County, the area that I know the best. Um, Boone County has got they, they packed the city of Columbia into two house districts, and then you've got three districts that take little pieces of of, I mean, of, of Columbia and run out into other counties. Mm-hmm. And if you look at um, look at look at Boone County, where you've got a Republican state senator, you've got. Um, two, 
three, depending on, mm-hmm. on your uh, state Republican state reps. Um, they they never win countywide elections there, right? They never win countywide elections in Boone County, um, but they have the whole legislative delegation, and they've had the legislative delegation. They've had the senator there for they have for twelve years now, mm-hmm. without winning Boone County. Um, because they pair it with Republican counties because they cut up Columbia, they move it around. They do it all over the state. They do right. it down in the boot heel. Um, they divide the Democratic pockets in the, in the boot heel. Uh, so the reason I don't want to harp on it is because um, I, I want to solve the problem. And uh, in 20, we don't, that, that's not going to I mean there are things happening on redistricting reform, but in terms of winning elections in 18 and 20, you know, that doesn't matter, come into play in 2022. And I, but, yeah, but it yeah, is critically it, important. Exactly, because it seems like some, in the last 20 years, seems like several key elections that were about the time of redistricting, without getting into the fight over gerrymandering or not. Mm -hmm. I remember back in the early 90s uh, when Ann Wagner, who at that point was one of the key operatives for the state Republican Party, was saying it was so key that they won, that they win all these elections in 90 to make sure that they were in a position to help draw the district, especially the congressional districts Mm -hmm. for 92 so that Ashcroft, who was then governor, could sign it into law before the gubernatorial contest, which ended up bringing in Mel Carnahan. Yeah. yeah, but the reason I bring this up, and this can kind of get into our next point about making sure you field candidates, is uh, your, the example you just brought up is certainly an example of not advantageous situation for Democrats. I'll bring up this kind of as a, as a rejoinder or counter. So in 2012, uh, redistricting created a district that – included most of Monroe County, some of Rawls County, and, and all of Pike County. Those three counties are historically Democratic counties, and frankly, a Democratic candidate should not lose. Paul Quinn did lose to Jim Hansen, and then the next year, a candidate ran that got no money and got 30% of the vote, and then last year, nobody ran against Jim Hansen. So... Y- I don't think yeah. that I don't think gerrymandering can explain that. I think there's a lack of recruitment and a lack of focus on resources and and an inability to field good candidates in some of these places too. And right. I, I think you, you want that's a big goal of yours. And, and both those things can be true, right? They're not they're not mutually exclusive. And so and that's a good point because w- when I first got to the party, um, what I tried to figure out was you know not uh, what do we have to do to be successful in 2018 and 2020? And I, I've been a candidate for the last five cycles, mm-hmm. so I was I was coming at it from a certain perspective. Um, and so the first thing I did is I like, get in my car and I drove around and I started talking to Democrats all around the state and say, you know, what do we need to do better? What 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 comments? What do you what are your, um, your thoughts on the party? And I came up with three things that the Missouri Democratic Party is going to do. So the state party is the state party. Democrats are going to do a lot of different things. Um, the grassroots organizations are going to do different things. The state party is going to do three things, and that's uh, recruit and train candidates, um, communicate the Democratic message and rebuild Democratic clubs and infrastructure like rural county clubs, young Democrats, and college Democrats. And those are the three things that, are, that as chair of the party, I'm focusing the state party on. And because you're, you're completely right, we need um, – in 2006, when, when Senator McCaskill ran for U.S. Senate the first time, there were 140 Democratic candidates for 163 seats. Last year, there were 97. Yeah. Um, and so – both those things need to be fixed. Now, the with the passage of Amendment 2, which does limit mm-hmm. donations to uh, legislative candidates as well as statewide candidates in Missouri, uh, for all its flaws, but on the surface, it would appear to bolster the power of state parties. Since you've taken over, are there, are there things that you've seen that either back that up or that run counter to that? I mean, I'm curious... What impact do you think Amendment 2 is going to have on your job and the rebuilding of the Democratic Party? Yeah, I, um, that's a good question. I, I think it's a little too early to tell. I think, we'll, I think we won't know until the end of the cycle because I think until we, we see what, you know, how some of the, the billionaires, the, particularly on the, I mean, only on the Republican side, that, that would be spending millions of dollars, how they do that, whether they do it through political parties or through House caucuses or through independent expenditures, um, it'll be difficult to tell. Um, from our perspective now, uh, we're really trying to harness sort of the grassroots fundraising. So one of the focuses we've had was getting people to do reoccurring donations. So instead of asking people for you know a thousand dollars, calling and asking um, a hundred people to do twenty five dollars a month, and and to to sort of take the um, the, the democratic frustration with Donald Trump and Eric Reitens and say, well, let's translate it into a tangible progress in a sustainable way. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the focuses we've done. My my assumption is. Um Assuming Amendment 2 does not ultimately get struck down in court, which I think is still a possibility, um, what I think is going to happen is the parties are going to be able to 
essentially run a lot of independent expenditures on behalf of candidates because one of the uh, advisory opinions says that you know committees can run as much money as they want in ads to support another candidate as long as it's not coordinating. Right. So you know we saw that I, I remember that was pretty much the status quo in 2006 when there were still limits. And I I think that gives the parties, both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, with a lot of power to decide which districts they're going to pour a lot of resources in and which are not, which I think can be the difference often between whether a candidate wins or loses. I'm I'm sure you're not going to disclose your your strategy on that, but but you aren't going to have unlimited resources. How are you going to kind of make your decisions about where you're going to spread some of this money that could be vital to, to gaining back? I mean, and it's that stuff ends up being decided in late 2018. Yeah. I mean, the things that we're really focusing now are, are getting to that position. Right? You need getting, candidates we need first. Candidates. Absolutely. Now, as you're traveling yeah. the state, what sort of climate are you running into now? I mean, uh, is it more fertile for Democrats because of people being upset with Trump? Or maybe they're not. I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, because there is this rural urban divide. So whereas in urban areas, people are all whipped up. It could be that in rural areas. I'm from rural Indiana. A lot of people are still, they're still hopeful that Trump's going to deliver on what they're hoping he delivers on. I'm just interested in what you're getting. I, and is that helping or hurting as you try to recruit people for next year? We'll say, well, first of all, as an American, I think we should all be hopeful that the president can deliver. Although I think it's becoming increasingly clear with every day that he's got neither the inclination nor the ability to deliver um, for, for the American people. Um, it, it, it depends on the crowd. I mean, I, you travel to, to 50 counties and each crowd is going to be different. Um, but what I've seen is uh, there is an absolute frustration um, with Donald Trump. There is a sense of shock and betrayal at uh, Eric Greitens. I mean, just utter shock that he's uh, behaving the way that he is and the ethics problems that he have. I mean, I think Republicans are stunned at this guy's ethics Yeah, but problems. none of this was secret. I mean, I'm not, I mean, saying it was good or bad, but, I mean, Greitens was c- raising millions of, fr- of undisclosed donations before the election. Greitens said, I mean, as early as last summer on, on the uh, debate that we hosted with all the Republican candidates, he was very clear he was for right to work and some of these other issues. Yeah, I mean, to, 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 to jump on Joe's point, I have heard so many anecdotes from people in labor unions and mm-hmm. not just labor leaders about how a lot of their friends voted for Eric Greitens, even though he was not trying to hide the fact that he would vote for right to work. That, to me, exactly. is a enormous failure on the Democratic Party's part to prevent something like that happening. I mean, have you heard some? Something yeah, oh, like absolutely. That too? I've got, I've got uh, the same thing to us. But here, here, let me, let me. This is the way I, I think the Democratic Party has been political victims of our own policy successes. So since Matt Blunt was elected uh, governor in two thousand four, um, people in, in labor have been saying truthfully. Right to work can happen this year, right? Right, and that's that's been a real thing for the last yeah, 12, twelve years. And b- right. before that, in, in those elections, and so for for years, it was the Republicans were always on the verge of passing right to work, and for years we held them off with just one or two votes or, or different things happening, and so I think a lot of people concluded that um, it didn't that it didn't matter. I talked to a, a guy that was driving the shuttle over at uh, Lambert, <laughs> Lambert Lambert Airport, um, and he works with the Teamsters. Uh, for UPS during the holiday season. That's the best time of his year. And he said that he uh, voted for Greitens. Um, he didn't think he was going to pass right to work. He thought that was just a talking point, and he was stunned that it happened. Why Why did he vote for Greitens? I mean, I, I'm just curious. Yeah, did I, I did ask he explain? Him, uh, he, was, he was guns. I asked him about that. That's what I figured. I figured yeah. it, it was the ad where he's blowing you, up stuff. You know, yeah. we've heard a lot of anecdotes of, of Trump voters who say, you know, I didn't expect him to do this on health care. I didn't mm-hmm. expect him to do it. And they're kind of scorned. I mean, I really feel like union members who did the same thing. I'm not saying they deserve to be scorned, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised they're not treated similarly. I mean, what do you think about that? No, I mean, I think. Uh, to a large extent, I think these Republican politicians just flat out lied to people. Well, see, and they did. They, Eric, Greitens, the Eric Greitens' campaign saying that he wanted to raise wages, right? He didn't, and now he's going to sign the bill that, that cuts the minimum wage in the city of St. Louis. That's the opposite he was doing. Donald Trump mm-hmm. said he wanted to provide health care for everybody, mm-hmm. and we haven't seen the AHCA at the time. It's, it's still a secret as of recording this, um, but the, the House version um, cuts millions of people off insurance. Mm-hmm. Um, so they 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 have misled and, and lied to the masses. Well, and some of this, I mean. 
from age here. But I mean, this goes back to the 80s. I mean, when Reagan, Ronald Reagan was able to get a sizable chunk of the labor vote, the general assumption was between 30 and 40 percent, which may be similar to what Trump got because of his message. And it wasn't until his second term that some Republicans were like, well, he's not, del I mean, these are, I mean, labor people are like, well, he's not delivering. Well, he, why did you think that he would? I mean, Reagan was very clear on what he was for and what he was not for. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in, tr in, in, in Trump's case, he campaigned on one thing and is doing something else. I think the thing with Greitens that surprises people and even the Republicans is the ethical problems, right? He campaigned sort of as this, this outsider um, that was going to help drain the swamp in Jefferson City. And I don't think, I think Republicans are stunned by the speed at which he's just uh, made himself comfortable in the swamp and, and expanded the swamp. I don't, I don't want to personalize this too much, but I do know that you've known the governor probably longer than most people because he, he taught in Columbia, I believe, for a while. And I think you were actually friends with him. I got to know him in 2007. Yeah. yeah. I, could you kind of explain what your your view of his transformation is from being, you know, kind of a Democratic person who almost ran against Blaine Luke DeMeyer in 2010 to what he is now. Right. Um, no, it, it's it's difficult because a lot of it uh, defies explanation. Um, you know, he's always been intensely ambitious. Um, I thought that he was coming at it when I knew him. Um, he was coming at it from a, a sort of a set of values. Um, you know, he was a Democrat. We talked about he was in my campaign kickoff in, in 2008. Um, offered to, to do anything he could to help me out. Um, and uh, I guess somewhere along the line, his ambition, um, you know, got the best of him and he sacrificed um, the beliefs that he had grown up with. And, and you know, people people can change parties, absolutely. Um, but we're not talking about somebody who changed parties. We're talking about somebody who completely changed ideologies. And that's different. And we're also not talking about somebody who went to, you know, college and grew up and had life experiences that changed ideologies. We're talking about somebody who had a PhD from Oxford, who was a Rhodes Scholar, who had been to Iraq, um, had done all these things, had come home and concluded um, that he should be a progressive. And then at some point in the next couple of years, without any explanation, uh, he's now a extreme conservative. Um, and so I, I think it was, I think he sacrificed, um, you know, everything that he had grown up believing um, for power. And it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's disheartening to watch somebody do that. And it's disheartening to watch somebody who, who pitched himself as this ethical leader, um, you know, just open up this dark money group and, uh, and, and just uh, viciously attack uh, people over genuine um, policy differences in his own party. And uh, it's, it's just been a, a never ending series of, of ethical problems that it just, it's, it's sad to watch. Now, how does it affect how the re Democratic Party approaches things? I mean, because Greitens going to be on in office until 2020. Uh, but how how does this affect how you approach things going into 2018? Are you using some of his problems or perceived problems as you try to recruit candidates, or are in your message, or are you looking broader? I mean, beyond the governor, more on other things. No, so this is this is how I, I think it. I think it's both how it shapes up politically and how it's, it's true is that the Democratic Party, we care about people having access to health care. That's something that's important to us. Um, and we want to improve the ACA, um, but any improvements need to result in better care and better coverage, more expansion for people. We care about public schools. We care about working people. Um, we're going to talk about those issues. Donald Trump and Eric Greitens care about themselves. Right. And that's that's just that's borne out by their, be, their behavior, by the evidence. Um, Donald Trump and Eric Greitens aren't trying to figure out how to get uh, minimum wage workers in the city of St. Louis a raise. They're not trying to talk, they're not sitting around trying to figure out how to help uh, people like Anita in Holt County who are desperately afraid of losing their health insurance, how to keep it. That's not something that they're focused on. They're focused on how they can make money off different deals, how they can keep billionaire donors happy. That's their priorities. So we're going to take our priorities and we're going to talk about what we're doing, what are, how our policies better benefit rural communities, how they better benefit urban communities. And we're going to talk about the ethical problems that they've gotten themselves into because they don't care about taking care of people. They care about promoting their own careers. Kind of to play devil's advocate as somebody who followed Eric Greitens' campaign pretty closely and went to a lot of his rallies, I have noticed that a lot of ordinary people that are not really heavily invested or involved in Missouri politics really came out strong at rallies and through social media for Eric Greitens. Maybe it was because they, they read his books. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because they were touched by the mission continues. And I, I could see that bond kind of growing as he continues to travel the state. And 
you know, use that strategy that was successful in the campaign kind of in his everyday governing. And I think that that's a really strong attribute that he has from a political sense that makes it pretty challenging for the Democratic Party to take him on politically. So I know that's that's kind of more of an observation than a question. But I mean, how do you kind of combat that? Yeah, his, 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 his human connection, which I think seems very genuine in many respects well, to, 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 the, to, the, to the voters. I'd say a couple of things. I mean, to me, the, the tragedy of him is that he's, he's using his talents to promote himself rather than to promote the general good. Um, and that's what makes the story um, it, it's so tragic, right? If it, it, um, I would point to people like uh, Pat Kerr. Uh, you probably read that letter um, mm-hmm. of somebody who put her name out there supporting him. Uh, she'd done a lot of work uh, with veterans. Uh, she believed in him. And uh, she was discriminated against um, uh, based on gender. And she is uh, wrote a very heartfelt plea with him. Uh, to do the right thing and to veto Senate Bill 43, which got employment discriminations. Mm-hmm. And that pits him uh, directly between um, these ordinary people that, that spoke up for him uh, and his billionaire donors. And he's going to have to make a choice on that. And to me, the choice is pretty clear. I think you go with what's good for people and the public policy, and you veto Senate Bill 43. It's not clear that he's going to do that. And if he chooses his billionaire donors over somebody um, like Pat, um, you know, that's just an example of it. That's something he's that's being multiplied tens of thousands of times by him choosing uh, these his his political career and these donors over these folks in Missouri who who gave him a chance. But beyond discussing the the yes. the governor, my whole point is, mm-hmm. how does any of this impact what you do to rebuild the party or getting you know getting the act together, so to speak, among Democrats for 2018? How does any of that help or hurt? It motivates uh, – we, we've had just a huge um, grassroots influx of, of volunteers and excitement. Uh, and, and that's a result of what, what, what Eric Greitens and what Donald Trump are doing. So our, our challenge of the party has been, okay, how do we capture that enthusiasm? How do we turn that enthusiasm into having candidates in, in northeast Missouri? And how do you – okay, right now, are there any – any special elections or anything coming up shortly, or are we talking yes. about something? Oh, that's, yes. Yeah. There's well, the, that's I know, but that's <laughs> I wanted to get him to talk about it. So there's special elections coming up in, in, in House District 50, um, in in southern part of Boone County, and into uh, Montauk, um, and a little bit of Cole County, um, and a little bit of Cooper County. Uh, there's a, spe- a special Senate election. Al Skaliski is our candidate there. He's a, he's a wonderful candidate. Um, Michaela Skelton in House 50 is a great candidate as well. Um, so those two races are coming up. Well, we've got a new um, a website, uh, MissouriDems.org, which we just uh, relaunched. And the cool part about it is it's got uh, the, the state of Missouri with different counties. Um, there's a map with all the different counties. You can go to the county and click on the county, and it's got the contacts for that county. It's got the Facebook page for that county. And the idea there was when I was traveling around, people kept saying, I want to get involved, but I don't know how to get connected. And so the idea was, well, let's, let's make a one-stop shop for people to get connected. We've got a new uh, email address, run at MissouriDems.org, um, that we're, we're encouraging people who are thinking about being candidates, who know somebody who's thinking about being a candidate, or know somebody who ought to be a candidate, but they just haven't thought about it yet. Um, to email us there, and when the, the state party will get in touch with them and talk about how they can get in, connected with trainings and the steps they need to take. And that's kind of the outreach that we're doing. I want to touch a little bit on the article that came out on Sunday about the question about whether uh, Missouri Democrats should accept socially conservative candidates into their ranks. So, I mean, I don't think the party has an ability to basically zap people off the ballot who are opposed to abortion rights or are are opposed to gun control. I mean, I don't think you have the ability to to prevent people from running for that. I I, I think the reason I wrote that was, A, whether, you know, there would be some discomfort within some of the Democratic base, which I think that there legitimately is, and B, whether that's an effective strategy or not, because – Let's take Senator Claire McCaskill, for example. Her positions on abortion and gun control are pretty well established. She supports abortion rights and is for some forms of gun control. Yet that has not stopped her from doing pretty well in rural Missouri. On the other hand, there is this kind of feeling that, if, especially as state legislative candidates, if you run candidates who support abortion rights and support gun control, they're going to be at a disadvantage to Republicans that take the opposite view. So... How is the how is the party going to deal with this situation? And would somebody who is socially conservative that's running in a competitive district be be 
penalized at all by the state party for taking those positions. The best candidates are candidates that are willing to work hard and are willing to say what they believe with conviction. And we've seen all kinds of candidates do that in rural areas. Um, we've seen Rebecca McClanahan win in Northeast Missouri, um, being pro-choice and, and doing it with conviction. We've seen Rachel Bringer uh, win in Northeast Missouri, um, who's very pro-life and is very sincere about her convictions. Right. Um, the best candidates are the candidates that work hard and will tell voters you know, what they believe and why they believe it, and that voters understand they truly are saying it. Um, so it's, it's not, party's not, telling people what to believe. We want candidates that will speak from the heart, work hard, and um, be able to stand in front of a room and tell people honestly what they think. I mentioned that because there was a political article that came out with, with that profiled Jason Kander, who's the former Secretary of State, who almost became a U.S. Senator, a very close friend of yours. Yeah, and, which I was going to segue into anyway. So yeah, great. Con- I segue. Continue. And um, he said something that had been said, I think he'd said before, that he didn't try to run as a conservative Democrat. And I... I I've become convinced that was not an implicit criticism of Attorney General Chris Coster, who did run as a conservative Democrat. He basically said that on the stump. I, I, I'm just wondering, though, um, why you think Kander was able to, you know, do as well as he did compared to the other candidates who lost by 10 and 15 points, despite, you know, maybe not despite, but kind of embracing some left of center views, basically. I, I respect both Chris Coster and obviously Jason yeah. Kander a tremendous amount. Um, and the thing about both those candidates, I mean, they ran very different races mm-hmm. and there were each campaigns and ra- races that reflected who they were. Like Chris Coster is, is personally more conservative than Jason Kander mm-hmm. and his race reflected that. And uh, I, I think that both of them ran um, you know, as who they are. Um, that's one reason I think that, that that Senator McCaskill, honestly, has done as well in Missouri. I mean, she she's won four statewide races mm-hmm. in Missouri um, because Claire McCaskill knows who she is, and um, she's upfront and honest with people, and people respect that authenticity. And I think both Jason and 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 um, Chris, Chris Coster ran that same way. So they re- led them, but naturally, since they're different people, to run different campaigns. Now, Coster, in particular, I want to bring that up is because I was following him closely. For about two or three years, uh, because he was appearing at Democrat Days, making these very passionate speeches, releasing uh, uh, issues papers on mm-hmm. on the importance of expanding um, Medicaid, for example, um, his push for some things that would be progressive. At the same time, he was upfront about his support for gun rights, had the NRA endorsement got a bunch of uh, rural endorsements. The uh, Farm Bureau endorsed right. him. He was like one of the first Democrats they'd endorsed for governor in decades. I mean, he did all that. Yet, he didn't do as well as Jason Kander did, who did not uh, do that route. The one difference, the one difference, I really believe this. I think that one of the reasons Jason Kander did better was the same reason the Eric Greitens did. One word, guns, and their ad. I mean, Jason Kander's ad about showing him uh, assembling an assault weapon blindfold, I think that um, I really believe that that touched a nerve in rural Missouri, especially in rural men. And um, while the Democratic Party, the base is African-Americans, women, and, uh, and other minorities, but especially women. Women, I mean, a higher percentage of women are in the Democratic correct. Party. Correct. No, it's both. Yeah, on both I mean, when correct. you look at the difference in the vote totals and Coster lost by five and Jason Kander lost by three, I think that one of the differences is, is that gun ad, there were some rural men. This is my speculation. There's no way to know. But per, per, perhaps young men, perhaps veterans who voted for him, and I think it was the gun thing. I think it was the same reason. He didn't have to say anything. He didn't have to go around and say, I'm either for gun rights or not against gun rights. It was him assembling that assault weapon blindfolded, and with Greitens it was the same thing. It was him blowing up stuff with that ad. I think it was the visual that that helped him. Now tell me, I could be all wet on that, but I think that that's why Kander did so much better than Coster, even though Kander didn't do all this work that Coster did. I mean, outwardly to try to woo the rural vote. Well, and as as chair of the Democratic Party, I think it's important. That the thing I'm interested in is that both of them substantially outperformed the top of the ticket. 
right? That shows that even in a state where our presidential candidate lost by 19.8 points, um, Democratic candidates uh, running good campaigns are able to run ahead of that curve. Right. Now, and both of them did that. So, so wait, wait, are there it. lessons from Candor that you are now, especially since you're friends with him, so you talk with him, I'm sure, candid conversations, right. that you're using now going forward? Yeah, I mean, the lessons that I think both Coster and Candor um, were both very good candidates in different ways, um, but they were both very good candidates. And the thing that they did was they worked incredibly hard. They both did. of them worked incredibly hard. No, uh, nobody, you know, people might have assumed that Coster was going to win. Nobody can say that Chris Coster took anything for granted or let up in any way. He worked every, very hard every single day. Um, and so they worked hard, and they were both authentic, and they were both real with people. And and they did outperform the top of the ticket as a result of that, and that's the kind of thing we're looking for in our candidates. I want to look forward to 2018. I think that there are two big races you're focusing on besides the legislative one. Mm-hmm. One is getting Nicole Galloway reelected auditor, which could be challenged. Well, uh, elected, because she's never run. That's true. But getting her elected to a full keeping Nicole term. Galloway as the auditor. Yes. yes, thank you, Joe. Yes. No, but the point is because it is yes. key. Yes. yes, but go ahead. And also um, reelecting Claire McCaskill. So before this show, I was looking. I, I was looking at her former results in not only 2006 and 2012, but also 2004 when she lost to Matt Blunt. Hmm. So not just in Northeast Missouri, which I've obviously been fixated on, but in other parts of rural Missouri. Um, in 2004, she got you know anywhere from 30 to 35 percent of the vote in outstate Missouri. She improved that to anywhere from 40 to 45 percent in 2006. And I think that's the reason she beat Jim Talon. Oh, yeah. Listen, Absolutely. that, and she'll, that, she'll was, tell you that was the Mel Carnahan rule. Mel Carnahan claimed that you had to get at least about 42 percent. Yes. So my In rural Missouri. My point for bringing this up is I don't know who is going to be Claire McCaskill's opponent. I don't know if it's going to be another Todd Akin or a Jim Talent. If it's a Jim Talent type candidate, it's going to be a much tougher race than 2012. With the Democratic Party where it is in rural Missouri right now, are you concerned that Senator McCaskill is going to get 30 and 35 percent as opposed to 40 and 45 percent that she needs to get? It's a Missouri election. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a tough election. And um, they're going to dump in tens of millions of dollars, um, tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars against Senator McCaskill. So uh, it is going to be a tough election. And nobody is under any illusion that's going to be anything other than uh, a difficult election. Uh, Claire McCaskill has an ability to connect with rural Missourians that um, a lot of people in the state just don't have, um, partly because of her background, um, you know, <coughs> being born and, and, and um, understanding rural Missouri that way, partly because as a, as a U.S. Senator, she shows up. You know, she's not, she's not scared to have a town hall. Uh, she did it um, before the ACA when people uh, were, were livid and angry. Um, at, at the process, and she showed up, and, and, and she listened to them, and she answered their questions. Uh, and she's do, she, she did it earlier this year, and she doesn't. She goes to rural areas. She goes to areas um, where, where Democrats don't always show up, and she shows up in those communities and takes any question that anybody in the crowd wants to ask her. Uh, and she's already said she's going to do more this summer. And I think that that's going to be a very clear contrast because we've seen um, you know, every single uh, Republican member of the congressional delegation that voted for Trump care um, they're all refusing to do in-person town halls. They're trying to do different things on the line, on the phone, not actually trying to face their constituents. Um, and that's going to be something that, that, that is going to be a very clear contrast that she does that, that she shows up, that she understands the issues, that she knows um, what's, what's going on, and she's authentic. And that's going to be important. Now, what can the state party do for her as opposed to, I mean, McCaskill will also have the Democratic Senatorial Campaign mm-hmm. Committee and mm-hmm. some other, but from the state party level, is there much you can do, or will you be focused more on Galloway? Well, so I want to. I think those three things that I outlined originally: recruiting and training candidates around the state, um, communicating the democratic message, and then rebuilding clubs and organizations are things that uh, are going to help both in the legislature and the legislative uh, races, as well as helping helping the, the the statewide, helping Senator McCaskill, helping Nicole Galloway, um, because if we have candidates everywhere, we've got we've got people pushing the democratic message. Mm-hmm. Um, if we've got you know, young Democrats and college Democrats that are established early. We've got rural clubs um, all across the state that are meeting and they're connected and that are uh, motivated. Um, then that's going to be those are going to be the folks that that help. You know, knock on doors, put up yard signs. Uh, and I think that 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 work that we're doing on those three things 
uh, translates to helping both legislative races and uh, Nicole Galloway and Claire McGaskill. What I, will your message be on Galloway? I'm sorry. Yeah, Jason. I was just going to – yeah, that was going to be my question. Yeah, so th- – I, and I want to be – we're not we're not running campaigns. No, no, no. I know that, yeah. and I did a radio feature on it a couple months ago. But, but I'm interested since then. I mean, kind of how you see the state party, what you can yeah. do to help her, because she probably will need your resources more than McCaskill will. Yeah, so I would say, well, there's sort of two questions on the on the messaging side. I, I think I think she's already um, established herself as an independent watchdog. And when you've got a Republican a supermajority in the House, Republican supermajority in the Senate, Republican governor, all Republican statewide, I think it's very important that the person that is um, auditing that and making sure that uh, everything is being done correctly um, is is from the other party. And there's that balance. And I think that Missourians do want balance. So I think uh, having a Democratic a state auditor with uh, everybody else being a Republican is important. And I think that people who are not partisan recognize that, that that's an important thing, that uh, the person, that the watchdog um, should probably not be in the same flock as everybody else. I think there's a lot of, I mean, it's a political race, so obviously there's political overtones to every race. But I think that there are long-term political implications to that contest because since no Democrat won any of the down-ballot races, I think that the Democrats need Nicole Galloway to win that race to have somebody who can run for governor or U.S. Senate in the future. Because after her, yes, there's Jason Kander, who's a possibility to run for, you know, some of the statewide offices. But frankly, his focus seems to be more national than than state right now. He might change his mind. And after that, the bench is pretty, pretty thin to run for things like governor, secretary of state, treasurer, lieutenant governor in, in three years. And I know we're we're far away from that, but a lot of the jockeying begins like after 2018, yeah. and that having a strong ticket there makes a difference for state legislative races and and and, and elsewhere. I think it's very important that we demonstrate that the Democrats can win statewide in Missouri, and I think Claire McCaskill and Nicole Galloway um, are, are are you know obviously are key to that. So uh, yeah, what I would say anybody that that wants to raid run statewide in 2020. Better be helping uh, Claire McCaskill and Nicole Galloway in 2018 because that's where the you know that that we have to win those races in 2018. Might yeah. you be running in 2020 for something? The only thing I care about is helping Democrats win in 2018. That is the only thing I do all day, every day, and that's all I care about is making sure this party is successful in 2018. Now you're close friends with Candor. I mean, well, I wrote a story several months ago on his rising national profile. What do you think was going through his head why he decided to do that as opposed to – I mean, Costner kind of went off in the shadows and now it's a big job with Centene and that he may be – never come back or he may be a few years before he does. But Candor is a different story where he's an analyst for CNN. Um, you know, he's now sought after at a lot of uh, Democratic events around the country. And I'll just add, if he's listening to this show, he is more than welcome to come back on the Politically Speaking I know, podcast, I've been by the hassling, way. I know, but continue, I Joe. Yeah, but – so – why do you think he's taking that approach? I mean, I've talked to him a few months ago, but I'm just, but as a friend, yeah. I mean, and what do you think that could do to help the party? Or we not? spent, so we, Jason and I spent a lot of the weeks after the election together um, because we were in similar places. Uh, well, both, you're both, both veterans. Both, too. both living in Columbia, and he was living in Columbia. Yeah, that's true. Um, and so uh, we were trying to get back in the gym and, and all that stuff after the election, which was a struggle. Um, and the thing that is really clear <laughs> to anybody that knows Jason, is that he really cares? And he he too deeply cares about um, public service and and good public policy. And so, uh, as we were going through those couple weeks, I think it became very clear to to both he and I, um, but, but from my perspective, watching him, that he needed to be involved in, um, in in fighting back against Donald Trump. He needed to be involved in um, serving um, the public. And the voter rights issue is something that he really championed as Secretary of State. Um, I think he, it was an area that he was successful in terms of putting you know, online registration. Uh, there's tangible things that he got done, uh, which you know, in, in the Missouri House, it was difficult tangibly to get anything done. He, as Secretary of State, he could make some tangible changes that made it easier for people to vote. And so as and he, he looked and he saw, um, there were other folks that saw it too, but he was one of the first to see this sort of wave of voter suppression um, that was going to be coming, that Donald Trump was going to be leading, and that he was using this, talking about these fraudulent votes as a way to crack down on, and, and reduce the ability of people to vote across the country. And so he put all that together and, and decided this is the way that he was going to continue to be involved. Uh, and I think he 
it, he is at his best when he's passionately talking about things that he cares about and, and, and allowing people to vote is one of those things. I know a lot of Democratic folk want him to run again for something here, mm-hmm. but, but he, he's not really positioning himself to, again, to run for governor or any of the down ballot. It seems like he's taking a much more national approach, which doesn't seem like the traditional way to get back into state politics. I guess I would have to ask him directly what he's going to do next, but is that a missed opportunity for Democrats if he's taking that approach, or is it better for the Democratic Party as a whole that he's looking more national than, than local right you know, now? I don't think, I mean, everybody, man, like, who knew in in 20, what, 13, where people saying Donald Trump is going to be doing, he's going to be next president of the United States? I mean, like, it, it's... Three and a half years. I, I think that he cares about an issue, and there's an opportunity to do that. And there's people all around the country that, that want to hear from him. Yeah. And I don't think that uh, if he wants to come back and do things in Missouri, I think that he'll actually probably be in a stronger position to do that. But I don't think it's an either or. I think he wants to be involved in um, in pushing back against this, uh, against Donald Trump, against voter suppression. I think there's opportunities to do that here in Missouri, and I think he, he does stuff like that, and he has done stuff like that. There's opportunities, unfortunately, all around the country, and he's he's showing up to do that too. Well, is this somewhat of a model? I mean, if you look at the way Greitens did it, Greitens, it was the first time he ran for anything, was for governor. But the point was he had created a somewhat national profile, and that helped him get donors. And then, uh, as Jason mentioned, I mean, I covered a number of his rallies, especially at the end, where there were all these young people who had come from all over the country. We're talking about Greitens. Greitens. But also candor, too. I went to a lot of his rallies, and there were a lot of young people really excited about him. Yeah, no, but but my point is, maybe I didn't make it clear, is that in some ways, candor's approach in some ways mirrors what Greitens did from the standpoint that Greitens created somewhat of a national profile and then ran for governor. And so if Coster, I mean, if candor now is somewhat of a national profile. Does that help him if he comes back and decides to run for I think for anybody, governor I mean, or Senate it, it, again? Whether you're running for a student council or for a higher office, I think having a big profile, a popular profile, relatively speaking, is, is, is always a, an asset. It's never a bad thing. Okay. Um, uh, I think the clear difference is that Jason Kander, there's a series of policies that he's supported for a long time and cares about. Uh, and I think he's getting into it because of that. Um, where he's, as I said, I'm not sure, I won't describe why Greitens started doing what he did, but we know where it ended up. One day we'll be able to read people's minds, but it is only 2017, <laughs> right. not 3017. Thank you so much for coming in for this great conversation, and you're always welcome back. Oh, there's one one quick thing I want to ask. There's been no Truman dinner. Is there not going to be one this year? There's going to be. It's in the fall. Oh, oh you're moving it to the fall. Yeah, it's it's going to be in the, the fall. spring. The summer or the fall. Will it still be in St. Louis or going to be somewhere else? It'll be in St. Louis. In St. Louis in the fall. Okay. Oh, indoors yes. or outdoors? It's been outdoors the last few years. Uh, it's getting to be indoors this year. Oh. Well, it was, okay. on, it was, it was at the Cardinal Stadium. Yeah, for a couple years in a row. Now, previously, it had been at the Renaissance. Yes. Yeah, which I... Yeah. And then, so... And there had been other places before, so... Um, Joe yeah. and I will cover it. I All can right. guarantee yes. it. We'll yeah, ex- we'll, we will be there. <laughs> we will be excited about it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. We're going to have it. We, we will succeed. For all of our stories at stlpublicradio.org, follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. Follow Joe on Twitter at, at Jay Manis. That's J-M-A-N-N-I-E-S. And how would people follow you on your suddenly very active Twitter account that <laughs> used to be very <laughs> dormant? You called me out on that two years ago. You're like, oh, this, this account's existed for seven years. I finally got the password from Abe. <laughs> Uh, it's a S underscore Weber with two B's. We'll S be, Weber. We'll be back next time. Until then, so long. <laughs>